Hey, welcome to the City Rev Life Podcast. My name is Pastor Roby, and I'm here with Pastor Alan Platt, one of our favorite leaders here, not only in the region, but really around uh, the globe. Uh, Pastor Alan leads Doxadeo Church in, what, is it four countries, 17 campuses in four countries on Uh, three continents? Well, it's actually 28 campuses. 28 campuses. in, uh, In nine cities in four nations. Four nations on three continents. On three continents. Yes. There you go. It's it's hard to keep track of. Okay, <laughs> and also the uh, City Changers movement, which is stirring up um, uh, gospel centered movements and uh, city transformational work in cities. Um, I think on six continents actually. Um, is that correct? Yeah, City Changers has really found traction with leaders all across the world, and we are extremely excited about having the privilege to share some of the principles that we've learned, not just as a local church, but also from City Rep. <laughs> we share that all over the world with leaders on a consistent but basis. But just for the record, we're, you're on six campuses, not, I mean, six continents, not all seven continents, just for the record. There's nothing in Antarctica. I mean, <laughs> has anything, have you just wanted to send a leader, like one sacrificial leader to Antarctica, just so you can say you got on all seven continents? You know campuses? where I come from, there are only five continents. And uh, we're, really? we're Is that right? all five. <laughs> uh, is that true in South Africa, there's only five yeah. continents? Well, <laughs> you know, Antarctica is kind of, Wrapped up with North America, so. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Well, you know, they can't get everything right in South Africa, yeah, I yeah. guess. So <laughs> anyway, glad to have you here, Alan. Here's what we're going to talk about. In a previous episode, we talked about, um, uh, Pastor Alan share with us just from a South African perspective and a global perspective, and also just his experience um, through the era of apartheid as a pastor, just mm-hmm. speaking into what's happening in our nation. A lot of discussions about um, racial equality and and social justice and very helpful podcast. I want to encourage you to go back and, and check that out. And of course, always you can always subscribe to the City Rev Life podcast and get every new episode um, automatically. Um, but before we jump into that, uh, we were talking about the differences with South Africa and the United States, but uh, you played some rugby back in the day. Is that right? Yeah, we... <laughs> You know, our sport is very different. So uh, yes. uh, we actually play football without helmets. Yes, it's violent. And we ride our motorcycles with them. <laughs> <laughs> so it's very different. But we play rugby, yes. Rugby. We love rugby. Yes. All right. Yes. You know, I'm, I'm just going to say it, Alan. I hope this isn't offensive. But you're not exactly the body type I associate <laughs> with a rugby player. Yeah. Yeah, so my rugby career did not last very long. <laughs> I did a, a little bit of it at high school, but I was far too small. And uh, so it never really worked. Never really played for the, the first or the A team. And, uh, but I enjoyed it. it, 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 it it's an incredible game. Brutal. But, uh, yeah. It's very, very brutal. It's loved in South Africa. And and might I just say, right now, humbly, South Africa is the world champion. Whoa. In rugby. So uh, just thought I'd You know what? Congratulations in. to you, Alan, <laughs> and to all of our South African listeners at City Rev oh, Life. Oh, my goodness. Well, um, anyway, let's get right to it. Um, we were sharing in a, in a previous episode just getting some perspective um, on what we are walking through from a as a nation as a as a local region as a city as we're talking about social justice we're talking about uh, racial equality and just wanted to hear from you alan as you're engaging leaders all over the world church leaders all over the world you're a um, you've spoken into our church where we you are beloved here at city rev Um, But just maybe share what's going through your mind as far as how you would challenge the church in in South Florida, how you challenge the church in our in our nation in this present moment. You know, what are some of the things that that you're thinking about, you're speaking about um, in, in terms of how the church can approach this moment? Well, let me start by saying we counted a real privilege to be in the USA, um, also at this particular time. But this is an incredible nation. Um, this nation has been a blessing 
to the globe uh, on so many levels. And um, whatever happens in the USA mm. finds amplification across the world. And so when the US gets it right, they bless the world. Mm. When they get it wrong, it affects the world. And uh, it's for that reason that we really believe that uh, also what is happening right now in terms of the tensions of, of racial discord and, and uh, just addressing the, the challenging issues uh, that have surfaced very recently are so incredibly important uh, to get it right because it will affect the rest of the world. Uh, we see that. It has already cascaded into many other environments across the world. Even South Africa is affected by what is happening in the U.S. right now. So just in this last several months, you know, with um, the, the death of George Floyd and, and then how that has transpired to the... Um, the protests, and in some cases, that's mm. turned to r even riots, and mm. and the conversation that's happening right now, and, and, and other events. I'm just speaking of probably one of the more prominent ones, but there's been other events as well. That's being talked about globally. Globally, uh, it is inevitable. Whatever happens in the U.S. will become conversation, and sometimes even actioned on within different places in the world. If I can give you an example of the amplification power of this nation. Mm. Uh, Roby, in, in 1994, the biggest human atrocity that has ever happened in the history of humanity happened in Rwanda and Burundi in Africa. Mm. In a short space of time, two tribes started to attack each other. A million people, just short of a million people, were slaughtered in three months. It was the biggest human devastation mm. that you can think of. If I have to ask you when it happened and do we reference it, it's perchance. A few years later, two towers fall in New York. Short of 3,000 people are killed. It changes history. It mm. is recognized and celebrated that date, 9-11, all across the world. The disparity is extreme. Mm but it shows the amplification capacity of this nation. Wow. Whatever happens here does affect the rest of the world. And um, obviously coming from South Africa, we have had our fair share of having to deal with race-based challenges, mm -hmm. um, social inequalities, disparities. Uh, it's, it's not always a simple journey. It's a, it's a challenging journey, but it's definitely a journey where the church can play a role. So the first thing you're, uh, I'm hearing you say is, a, I think as the church, appreciating how what happens in the United States gets amplified around the world is something that we need to steward and we need to understand yeah. is, you know, that's a reality that is, uh, is a blessing, but with that comes a lot of responsibility. Yeah, it's a grace that is upon this nation, and um, it's something, you know, that, that when you're aware of it, you recognize the importance, as you say, of, of stewarding that particular engagement. And I can only encourage the church not to withdraw from some of these very difficult conversations uh, because you have to have a voice hmm. in that context. You know, in Africa, we have a saying, it takes a village 
to raise a child. I know you've used that in certain settings here, but for mm. all, what, what it means for us is that your village, your context, influences so much about how you view the world. Your worldview, your beliefs, your values, your behavior is all affected by your immediate context. And so if you grow up in a particular environment, you're going to manifest the, the, the mannerisms and the behavior and the values of that particular environment. And so if it's true that it takes a village to raise a child, that our context influences us very deeply, the question bodes, who raises the village? Who determines the values, the convictions, the orientation of our village. And my submission to you is that if the church is absent in that conversation, wow. we cannot have an attitude when some godless uh, people are defining our village. And so we have to show up, but it's how we show up. Hmm. We don't show up with arrogance. We don't show up with uh, a sense of pride and, you know, come to the table with this, this arrogant spirit just with three scriptures. We actually come representing kingdom life. Hmm. And it's that conversation that I believe the church is engaging in right now, is what does that look like for the church to truly show up in the conversation of the challenges of our context? I love that uh, if a village raises a child, who raises the village? And it's the church should be there fathering its village, fathering its city, being a father to it, a spiritual father. And uh, which I think you, I mean, I've heard you say, <laughs> I'm saying that only because you've said that. Um, in fact, you've, this is, a, you, you've written about this also in your City Changers book. Yes. We actually talk about the presence being at three levels. Okay. Fathering presence, which is taking that responsibility and showing up, mm -hmm. being present. A faithful presence, which means we manifest the very nature of kingdom life. Mm -hmm. We represent what it means to, to love, to forgive, humility, the self-sacrifice. We manifest that as the faithful presence of Christ within our world. Mm -hmm. But then there's also a fruitful presence. Mm. And the fruitful presence is where we ask, what can we do to change things? That's good. To affect things. Um, and it's the combination of these three dimensions that actually brings the presence of Christ into our, our world. If someone wanted to read a little bit more about what you've what you've said about that, Alan, and kind of what Doxdale does. They can they can read that in your book. Is that right? Yeah, I think the best uh, resource is the book because we really somehow used our journey as the the basis of writing the book, extract, extracting the principles mm -hmm. of what we've learned over the years. And they can order it on Amazon. It's City on Ch Amazon and. Uh, uh, it's called City Changes. City Changes by Alan Platt. Um, I, I had not thought to make sure that they know about that resource. Otherwise, I'd have brought my copy. And uh, I've read through it many highlights in mine. Um, and that book is a deposit into City Rev. There's a lot in there that uh, we think about as well. But um, anyway, back to what we're talking about. A, if a village raises a child, the church should rise up and have a fathering presence in its city and in its village. And so, um, and then in, in, in a sense, you've challenged us then to think as, as a church, um, understand the amplification factor happening globally, and that's a steward, it's a grace, mm -hmm. understanding our fathering responsibility here in the, in the city, and then uh, also having a, a faithful presence and a fruitful presence. Can you speak a little bit more to the fruitful presence part of it? That's where it's um, not just being there and being there faithfully, but this is where we strategically think through 
how we how we engage our city and we we um are not just a voice uh, alone that's a key part but we're taking kind of a strategic fruitful catalytic engagement could you just speak a little bit to that we would always challenge the church to think about the engagement within the community as as a whole because you know the gospel there is a depth to the gospel Christ in us, mm -hmm. recognizing who we've become through Christ. We, we died with him. We were raised with him. We are seated with him in heavenly places. We are blessed with all spiritual blessings in the heavenlies, in Christ. These, these are all the components that, that we see in Scripture in terms of our personal salvation and our personal journey. But then there's also a breadth of the gospel. This is where it's not just Christ in us, but it's Christ in all. And if you read, actually Colossians does such a good job when Paul writes about this. He starts off by saying, hey, you know what? The gospel has deeply affected your life. Uh, you've been set free. Uh, you know, you've, you've been translated from, from the power of darkness into the kingdom of uh, the sun and and and." You know, Jesus has made a show of the enemy openly by stripping him of his authority and his power. And immediately after that, in verse 15 of Colossians 1, he says, Now let me explain to you, he is Lord of all the universe, all things, all things, all things. It's repeated there so many times. And sometimes we, in terms of our understanding of the gospel, only focus on the personal salvation part or the depth of the gospel in our own lives and not necessarily understanding the breadth of the gospel, that Jesus is Lord of all. And so if he's Lord of all, the question is, how do we engage the all? Mm. And what is your all? And, and all means all in every language. <laughs> And so it's this everything concept that we need to, to navigate. And so we know how to engage much of our all in terms of love, but not always in terms of hope. Mm -hmm. And the difference we say is that love addresses the pain, but hope addresses the brokenness. And the difference between pain and brokenness is, is that Pain is when you see somebody drowning in the river and you run in to go and save that person. But hope is really when you go upstream to catch whoever is pushing them into the river. It's the systemic brokenness components of society. And so the church, for the most part, has been, has been pretty effective in running into the river to go and help and save but we haven't always been part of the conversation when it's about who's pushing them into the river and I think that's where we are right now is we're asking questions about some systemic broken references within the context of society and how can the church be part of that particular conversation but it all starts, of course, with just our hearts. Our hearts need to shift because it's not just about legislation. It's about the transformation of the hearts of God's people. Yeah, that's... I had a, an email when we started this conversation a little bit more in depth than we ever had about a month ago, or maybe two months ago, talking about racial equality, social justice, and we talked about it uh, on our weekend services, and then we talked about it. We started talking about it through this podcast. And I got an email um, of someone saying, "Can we? Th this is social justice is not something the church should be talking about. We need to get back to talking about just Jesus and the Bible." <laughs> and um, the the kindest way I know to respond to something like that is to say. Well, what about when Jesus in the Bible addresses social justice? <laughs> and part of that is out of you know Colossians 1, 
uh, versus, uh, you know, as you were saying, chapter one in 19 and 20, you know, he reconciles all things to himself. And so we, we as a church, we love this city. I mean, Jesus didn't just preach at them. He, he, he fed their, their bodies. He healed their bodies. And so we've got, to, we've got to be a part of justice and righteousness in our cities. And um, you see God's people doing that all through the Scripture, especially the Old Testament. Guys like Nehemiah in a Persian context, you know, bu- you know, seeing to it that a wall is built. Daniel seeing, to, you know, in a Babylonian context. We have got to understand the role of the church. I, I, I just so resonate with what you're saying, Alan, is not just... Um, the the pain, the social part, but also being a voice in the systemic part, the brokenness, and uh, separating it from as love and hope, that's profound because love drives us to help the hurting person right in front of us. You know, that, that was you know the, the good Samaritan. But you have to have hope to address a systemic brokenness because the, hopelessness is what keeps us from envisioning and wanting to be a part of the systemic brokenness. And so a lot of times I wonder if Christians and in the church, there is not their hope in Christ and what Christ can do in a city is not robust enough to imagine that a city down through the systems could be transformed, that the education system, that the legislation system, that the economic system, that the gospel and the power of Christ can even transform those things as it's transforming souls and bodies. It can actually transform that. It requires a, a big um, a big hope in what Christ can do, that what he prayed that God's will uh, would be done on earth as it is in heaven right. can really be applied to that. And so hope is, is important for that. I think the challenge for us when somebody makes a statement like, let's just preach the, God, the Bible, is what Bible are you talking about? Because, you know, sometimes we only read what we believe. And Ooh. we are actually so many times... Uh, unaware of our deep dualistic approach to scripture because I mean scripture is just loaded with an understanding of social engagement it's 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 massive when you start reading it through the lens of recognizing that and so many times our Christianity has become a relationship with Jesus and based on morality and we've separated that from an engagement within our, re- our context and the social mm-hmm. components of that. Um, it's very much, Roby, like the people of Jerusalem. Hmm. They loved Jerusalem. Remember, Jerusalem was the city of God. It was the city that had the construct of how God wanted everything to be ordained. And, and uh, it was Jeru Shalom. Hmm. Shalom meaning wholeness, completeness, health, welfare, safety, soundness, prosperity. All of those components was in this concept of Shalom. Hmm. Shalom is an interesting term used in, in many ways in the Bible. When they, when they went through the river uh, of Jordan to, to, uh, and they built this altar of unbroken stones, the word there for unbroken is the word Shalom. It means whole. When they completed the wall in 52 days, the word completed is the word shalom. It's used in very interesting ways. So here in the mind of the Jews, they they saw Jerusalem, the whole city, God's presence. This is where, where they can exercise their engagement. But there was another city about 430 times in Scripture, right from Genesis all the way through to Revelation, that was the antitype of Jerusalem, was called Babylon. And Babylon was everything that was the opposite of Jerusalem. It was the place that the Jews despised. They, they, they looked down on Babylon. Actually, if a, a good Jew wanted to insult you, he, we would say, man, go to Babylon. And so they lived in this tension between the city of God and the city of man, the city of depravity. And then the unthinkable happens. <laughs> the Babylonians come and they conquer Jerusalem and they take the people of Jerusalem as exiles all the way to Babylon. 
Now they're sitting there at Babylon. They're there at the river. They've hung up their harps. They are despondent. Their only prayer is, Lord, get us out of Babylon. And it's in that context that God speaks to them through the prophet. Actually, the fascinating thing is the Babylonians come to them and say, um, we hear you guys sing such great songs. Would you sing us a song? And then they say, by the rivers of Babylon. How can we sing a song in a strange land? What were they saying? Hmm. How could we exercise our spirituality in Babylon? We can't sing our songs here. We have to go back to our sacred space. We have to go back to Jerusalem. We, we can only really give expression to our spiritual convictions in Jerusalem. Not here in Babylon. And it's in that context that God speaks through the prophet Jeremiah. And we often quote this scripture, not even knowing the context. Jeremiah 29 verse 11. I know the thoughts that I'm thinking about you, says the Lord. Says the Lord, thoughts of peace, of shalom. Mm. Here in Babylon. Wow. But it must have been verse 7 that really rocked their world because... Mm. The prophet says, now seek the peace. Seek the shalom. What does that mean? Wholeness, completeness, health, welfare, safety, prosperity, harmony. All those concepts are the shalom concept. God says, go seek that for the city to which I have brought you captive. <laughs> that must have shattered their world. God, you're actually in this. You brought us to Babylon. Yes. How else will you bring shalom to Babylon unless the people that represent shalom engage Babylon? And then he says, for in its peace, in its wholeness, you will find wholeness. Roby, once we start to understand hmm. This dimension of our engagement, it changes the way we think about church. Our whole ecclesiology changes to become more of a missiology. How are we on mission? Mm. Actually, this statement is a statement that really has challenged me very deeply. It's a missiologist, David Bosch, that made this statement. He says, the church does not have a mission. The mission has a church. Big difference. The reason for mm. our existence is because we are on mission mm. to bring the shalom of God to the context that we find ourselves in. Man, powerful, Alan. You've challenged us to, um, to have a fathering presence that we understand our role in the city um, to, um, to have a faithful presence, specifically in the American context, to have an appreciation for the amplification that happens, and then a fruitful presence. And part of that is understanding there's, there is a spiritual realm that we speak into, there's a social realm that we speak into, but not to neglect the systemic, upriver, the broken system, there speak into those. And then to understand that we're operating in, in, a, in a Babylon context and we've got to hear that that word in jeremiah 29 to us we've got to love this city we've got to understand we're exiles yeah. i mean that's how peter refers to sure. us he says to you exiles so we're, we're called exiles we're here in we live in a in a lost city and to have that that presence here so alan as we're wrapping up any uh, how would you challenge someone who's a part of city rev uh church a word for for us in this season as we're we're sorting through um, the injustices in our city, how would you challenge us as in individuals who are part of City Rev? Well, first of all, I recognize that certain churches and ministries have particular redemptive callings hmm. that are not necessarily the same with every church. When you took time to consider your identity as a church and established it within this name of city, Revelation, the, 
the revealed engagement of Christ within the context of your, your city, it, it so reinforced what many of us looking from the outside toward you recognized as the calling and anointing mm. that God has put upon this church. And I can just encourage you not to lose sight of the fact that you have been called as a ministry to engage in some of the areas of, of our society at large that um, are not necessarily the comfortable, easy, you know, just gathering of the saints so that we can, you know, listen to encouraging and, 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 and blessed uh, teaching. But really, there's something about an equipping for mission. And I want to just encourage you as a church uh, to continue on this path, to recognize your calling, the mandate God has given you, uh, and in many ways, you know, if I think about Doxideo, our, our name means the glory of God and was based on the Habakkuk 2.14 scripture that says, the knowledge of the glory of the Lord will fill the earth as the waters cover the sea. And, and that's been our journey. And I see many similarities in your journey to the journey that we have had. And let me just say this. So glad we've done what we've done over the last 25 years, recognizing the calling on our ministry and staying true to it. But here's what's very important. When we say a church has this calling, this is not some nebulous, broad stroke kind of, you know, oh, it's the church. This boils down to every individual. Because the fact that you are associated, committed, connected to this church means this mantle is upon your life as an individual. And so you are grappling with the same conversation within the context of your everyday life. How do you bring revelation to your city? Taking faith, love, and hope to your context. And I, I would just take this opportunity to say, I think we need so many more of these church um, communities that take up this mantle in this time that we're living in. Really a challenging season. We need this voice. We need this engagement. And so we bless you. We speak grace upon you and thank you for your uh, very distinct contribution that is felt right now in this region. God bless you for that. Uh, thank you, Alan. Uh, thank you for your, your deposit in us over the years. So grateful for you. Hey, thank you so much for joining the uh, City Rev Life podcast. Uh, we hope to see you on a future episode. Thank you for joining us on City Rev Life. You can subscribe to this podcast, rate and review wherever you're listening to this. And we love it when you share it with your friends on social media. For more videos and content, go ahead and check us out at cityrev.org podcast or download our City Rev Church app. Have a great day.